All right, welcome everyone to our third installment of Tennessee Writers, Tennessee Stories. And uh, thank you all for coming out on sort of this rainy Saturday morning, but gosh, it's nice to have the rain out there, isn't it? You can already tell the grasses are greening up a little bit, so uh, thank you for coming out this morning. My name is Jeff Sellers. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs here at the Tennessee State Museum. And we have had so much fun with this writer series. It's a great way just to, to, to build a platform for t Tennessee authors to impart their stories that they've been researching and sort of getting that scholarship in front of the public and just setting a table for a, a great conversation. And so that's what we're gonna do this morning over the next hour. We're just gonna have a great conversation and share thoughts and ideas and questions with each other here. Um, I do want to uh, first thank our, sponsor, our, our sponsors, our partners in this program. First of all, beginning with Vanderbilt University Press. Thank you to Betsy Phillips for being here. Uh, also, Humanities Tennessee in Chapter 16, uh, Sarudin Gerbman is here. Thank you, guys. Uh, we cannot do uh, all of these programs without our community partners, and it's such a pleasure to get to work with them. Uh, before we jump into today's topic, I do want to put a little plug in for next week. I see some of you are, are, are returning um, folks uh, that have been to all of our programs. You don't want to miss next month's program. It will be, uh, our featured authors will be Dr. Lee Williams and Ami Thurber, and they will be talking about their book, I'll Take You There, Exploring Nashville's Social Justice Sites, published by Vanderbilt University Press. That is going to be a big one because they're both gonna be um, here and uh, talking about this, this great book and this great research that is uh, out there. What date is it? August 13th at 10.30, same time, uh, 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 each month here at the State Museum. Um, all right, let's jump into today's book and our featured author for today. It is, of course, Hot Hot Chicken, a Nashville story by Dr. Rachel Louise Martin. And I'll just sort of set up the book. Australia advertises that they fry Nashville-style chicken. You know it. Thousands of people attend the Music City Hot Chicken Festival each year on July 4th. The James Beard Foundation has given Princess Chicken Shack an American Classic Award for inventing this dish. But for almost 70 years, hot chicken was made and sold primarily in Nashville's black neighborhoods. And the story of hot chicken says something about race relations in Nashville especially as the city tries to figure out what will be our future. Um, I'll also say that this book is in, uh, on sale in the museum store, uh, and Dr. Martin will graciously sign copies of the book uh, at the end of the program today. Rachel Louise Martin is a PhD writer and public intellectual. She earned her doctorate in women's and gender history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her work has appeared in O Magazine, The Atlantic Online, and City Lab. She was a guest editor and reader for Narratively. She has been featured on the BBC's Food Chain, KCRW's Good Food, and the Michelle Miao Show. Her, her essay, How Hot Chicken Really Happened, was included in Cornbread Nation 2015, The Best of Southern Food Writing. Uh, and on a personal uh, note, she and uh, Rachel and I sat around seminar tables together in graduate school. So this is the first time we've uh, had a reunion in many, many years. So uh, it's it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Martin here uh, in, on the on the podium with us at the State Museum. I do want to read to you what she says on her website because I think it's so eloquently put and it's a shared mission for this program series as well as the State Museum. Uh, Rachel Martin did not do her graduate uh, school to be a professor. She began her career as an entertainment journalist which is where she realized people's stories could illuminate the larger question she has about why inequality and injustice persist in America today. She sees her work as a writer and a historian as a form of social justice, a means of addressing the wrongs of the past so as to offer hope for the future. She believes in the power of stories, 
to turn America into the American dream, making the nation more equal and a land of opportunity for everyone. And I think that is the power of stories in a lot of ways. And that is sort of the, the co-mission of our work. I will also put in a plug for her. Uh, her next book is forthcoming. It's called A Most Tolerant Little Town. It will be published by Simon & Schuster in 2023. If you are not following her on social media, uh, do so. You will want to follow her. She is already a local and regional star, but she is got, she's got big, big, um, big things happening in her world. So please follow Rachel. Um, to moderate our, our discussion today is Khalil Ekelana, who, has, um, who is the WPLN's uh, host of This is Nashville, so he is the perfect person to uh, uh, moderate our discussion. Khalil has been involved in, with media for almost his entire life. Recently, he served as the host and producer of No More Normal, the pandemic-focused radio show on KUN in Al Albuquerque. He's also served as a co-host of Good Day New Mexico. Born in New Jersey, raised in Mar Maryland, Khalil received his degree in politi political science from Elon University. During his time in Los Angeles, Khalil worked as an educator for at-risk high school students and an associate producer for film, and he founded the hip-hop group Fresh Air. So, Khalil, you have a, a, a great story in your own right that we'd like to hear as well. Uh, let's welcome Khalil and Rachel to Tennessee Writers, Tennessee Stories. Thank you, Jeff. That was a fantastic introduction. Very generous. I appreciate it. And thanks also to all y'all for coming out today. It is raining. At least one of you also helped me close down a restaurant last night. So I am appreciative that you have opened your eyes and shown up today. Um, and I'm so excited. Uh, this book came out a little over a year ago, but this is my first in-person book event. So I get to see your faces. I'm not staring at a camera in my office, which is very thrilling for me. Um, I'm going to just kick things off by reading a little portion of the hot chicken mythology, and then we're gonna move into our conversation and then open it up for y'all. So be thinking of questions. Hot chicken's creation has become part of Nashville's mythology the sort of tale locals can recount with practice pauses and wry chuckles. It happened like this. Back in the 1930s, or maybe it was the 1920s, or perhaps as late as the 1940s, or even the 1950s, well, anyway, there once was a man named Thornton Prince III. He was a handsome man, tall and good-looking, fine as a peacock. Beautiful wavy hair, said his great-niece, Andre Prince Jeffries. Debonair with a dashing sense of style and a touch of Tennessee twang, or so I assume. Women loved him and he loved them right back. He was totally a ladies' man, Jeffries laughed. He sure had plenty of women. So one day, Sunday morning back sometime before most of us were born, Thornton Prince III came in from a long night of catting around and he told his woman, wife, girlfriend, does it matter? to make him breakfast. Well, this woman, wife, or girlfriend, or whatever, she was fed up with his philandering ways. What could she do with a serial cheater like this? Some women look the other way. Some get even. Of this one, though, she wanted retribution. She started out by playing it sweet. That morning, just like all their other morning afters, she got up before him. And she didn't make him dry toast or gruel, oh no. She made him his favorite. She made him fried chicken. After all, Sunday morning was that time of the week when families across the South woke up expecting to enjoy some popping hot fried chicken for breakfast. This woman wasn't making her chicken with love, however. I like to think she went out and wrung the neck of the skinniest, stringiest yard bird she could find. No plump church chicken for this sorry son of a gun, no sir. Then she added the spiciest items in her, her kitchen. Dried pepper flakes? Maybe. Fresh chilies plucked from her garden with all their seeds? Perhaps. Half a bottle of Tabasco sauce? It could be. She couldn't run to the grocery store to get something, Jeffrey said. 
Nobody knows what went into that first hot chicken as she layered on whatever she had on hand. Whatever she added, by the time the bird was cooked, Thornton Prince III's woman was sure she had spiced it beyond edibility. As Thornton Prince III took his first bite, she must have braced herself for his reaction. Would he curse? Whimper? Stomp out? And where was she while he ate? Maybe she was in the kitchen, scraping and seasoning her skillet. Or perhaps she fled to the back bedroom, ready to scamper if he made a big fuss. I like to think she was sitting right there at the table with him, cutting into her own chicken, unpeppered, of course, ready to push the charade as far as she could. But her plan for revenge backfired. Thornton Prince III loved that overspiced poultry. He took it to his brothers. They loved it also. Soon enough, the woman disappeared from his life, but her hot chicken lived on. Thank you all for being here. Um, and Rachel, thank yes. you. Thank you. So you grew up here and you left for a decade. You came back to a different place from what you remembered. Did you have any type of culture shock when you came back? Well, I spent most of the first three years I was back here lost. Mm. I mean, I, gr I grew up in the area. I didn't need a map to know where I was, right? And then all of a sudden, no streets led where I thought they went. None of my landmarks were still here. It was, it was very disorienting at first. And there were also all sorts of cultural changes that had happened as well. well what was it like? What was Nashville like when you were growing up? Mm, Nashville, when I was growing up, it was a very big, small town. So it was a sort of place where people I ran into on the street or at an art festival, we could trace our people back and figure out how we were supposed to know each other or how we could be connected. And I can still do that in a few corners of the city, but overall, that, that part of this reality has gone away. So you see this change in this town that you grew up in. The structure, the landscape is different. A lot more people have come here from different parts of the country and certain parts of the world. How did that, how did that difference, how did that inspire you to really dig into this Nashville history that's, that's evolving in a way? For me, as much as things were changing, there were still some choices that we were making as a city that were remaining the same. And so it felt really important to delve into who we had been. I think often when it comes to growth and development, when it comes to where we're headed in the future, it can feel like kismet. It can feel like destiny. It can feel like, of course, this is how the city will develop. The reality is all of our neighborhoods are a product of the choices made in the past, and what they will become in the future are the product of the choices we're making right now. And that's, that's what I wanted to explore. I realized there hadn't been a good history written of Nashville's urban development. So I decided to write about interstates and trick you into reading it with chicken. <laughs> so describe that process as you, as you began that research. Well, the real origin for the book was a graduate school class at Chapel Hill. I took it with Fitz Brundage, who loves interstates. And so he was talking about interstates around Durham and Savannah and elsewhere across the South. And as he was talking, I thought, I-40. I-40 suddenly makes sense. I-65, oh, that's what I-65 did to my town. Ah, uh, I-24, and why I, my parents, or my, my people are from Nashville, but I grew up in Rutherford County. That's how we landed in Rutherford County. And so that was the very early genesis of this. But that when I came back to Nashville and all of a sudden everybody was eating hot chicken, and I didn't know what hot chicken was, interstates and chicken collided. And it, as I started researching 
the story behind the hot chicken. How could there be a food that 10,000 people showed up to eat on July 4th? And I'd never heard of it. As I started diving deeper into that story, that's when I, that's when I realized all the parallels. You, you mentioned I-40, and on page 116, you write about Edge Hill activists learning that, quote, they could resist the city's plans for their neighborhoods, but only if they acted swiftly, mobilized widespread community support, managed the media, and refused to surrender. Now, with development occurring at such a rapid pace in our town and neighborhoods changing, I want to know, do you think that approach is still possible in today's Nashville? I think it's the only approach that possibly works in today's Nashville. Um, as long as we're existing as individuals within this city, we're not going to have the power to control or change where the city is headed next. It's only when we band together as a community and begin to make choices and demands, it's only when we're showing up at the Metro City Council meetings or even joining Metro City Council ourselves that we can start to know where the next plans are headed, what developers are working on right now. One of the shocking things to me when I was researching the book was that by the time people in Nashville knew I-40 was going to destroy Jefferson Street, it had already been planned for over a decade. There had already been a public meeting. It was just that nobody knew to go to it. And, and so for us to be working together, having conversations about who we want to become, making very intentional choices about how we're going to get there, listening to each other, hearing each other, letting each other get really mad, because some of us should be really mad. Um, it's only once we work together as a community like that that we can choose something different in the future. One good way to build community is uh, to do it while breaking bread or sweating over chicken. I like it. So, you know, you highlight the different urban and renewal projects that the city has undertaken in its history. I think maybe we're on six right now, number six, you would say? Right. You know, zoning laws, housing codes coupled with the construction of freeways have decimated black neighborhoods. The prosperity of Jefferson Street in the 60s being obstructed is probably one of the most notable ones. You know, many see this as an injustice and it highlights the city's priorities. Now that we are the it city, and again, people moving here from all over, but they have no knowledge of this history. What do you want people who are new to Nashville to know about who and what made this city what it is today? I think it's incredibly important for the people who are just joining Nashville right now to learn the same thing that many of us need to know, even if we've been here for three, four, five generations. And that is that the landscape we see around us, this area right here, Bicentennial Mall, it was once full of people. The interstates. That was once a thriving community. There were streets, there were families, there were communities, there were churches, libraries, schools. And they were raised and the people were displaced without any real accommodation being made for how to maintain the community or where to move them. In fact, it was done purposefully to destroy the communities. And I think it's important for us to wrestle with that fact and to look at how we're doing that today. And it's way too easy to become part of the problem. I bought a house right out a year ago. I know, for a writer, can you believe it? Um, <laughs> and I, I talked to my realtor and I said, okay, here's the deal. I cannot be part of the problem. You have to find me. I'm, I'm obviously white, this is not a surprise, you have to find me a neighborhood that has been historically white. So I moved out to Old Hickory Village. It's where I, somebody like me should be, right? And so bought this cute little historic house, it has a historic overlay to it, just like it should, nobody can tear it down, I love it. And then I looked around and said, oh, 
all of my neighbors who've been here for a while, they used to work at DuPont factory. Their people have been here for generations, and now they're getting priced out of this neighborhood by people like me. As much as I don't want to be a problem, I'm driving property taxes out. I'm forcing my neighbors out. There are lots of conversations in every corner of this city we need to be having. Now, the popularity of hot chicken has really exploded as gentrif gentrification and development expanded. How is that? What's unique? about those parallels? Well, for one thing, it's in every neighborhood of the city now. And that is very new. Well into its history, there was really only one hot chicken. And that was Prince's. And then there was Columbo's. And that was run by one of the Prince's former cooks and kind of sort of halfway an in-law. Um, <laughs> And so it was a family experience. And at this point, you go down to the street corner and you're going to find hot, you go to Target and you're going to find hot chicken. It's, it's everywhere. And so it's, that has really changed. And you talk about breaking bread and using, using food and, and that aspect as a way of building community. When you can stay in your OK, I think I'm back. <laughs> when you can stay in your own community and eat with people you live near, you look like, you get along with, you're no longer crossing any boundaries. You're not meeting new people. You're not building new relationships. So it's great that chicken is easily available, but it also breaks down the opportunity we have to be getting to know each other. Do you think like all the people who are moving here, do you feel like this new influx of Nashvilleians, maybe over the past 10 years, do you feel like they're fully invested into this town as the folks who grew up here and have been here for generations are? For both sides, it depends, right? Mm. I swore I'd never live here again. Here I am. Um, so they brought you back. <laughs> Family. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Massachusetts. I never intended to be a professor, but I ended up a professor. I was, so I was in Amherst, Massachusetts, and I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I did shocking things like wear lipstick. <laughs> Suddenly, I was the Rachel who wore lipstick. People would say, oh, I heard about you. You wear lipstick. I said, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just reached a point. I wanted to be writing. I wanted to write these sorts of stories. This is where my stories are. And I also wanted to be working on the issues that I, I really cared about, the things that had driven me to being a historian and a writer. And I needed to be back home. Mm -hmm. Now, in the book, we were talking talk about gentrification and how hot chicken is spread everywhere. You know, you talk about the difference in the conversations people have about hot chicken popping up on Yelp and other things in this new, quote unquote, Nashville. How much, so how much is, I'm interested, how much does class and privilege, how much is that influencing the conversation just around the dish of hot chicken alone? I think it's an incredibly, uh, anytime we start talking about any aspect of inequality, most of this book on the surface of things is about race. It is also always going to be about class, it will also always be about gender. In my mind, this is really a women's history book. Um, so it's about, yeah, who's making money off of this? Who, feel com who assumes they belong in certain restaurants? Who assumes they don't belong in certain restaurants? It's all intertwined, and it's almost impossible to 
unpick any one of those areas and just pursue that aspect. Mm -hmm. And I, you mentioned that this woman, it's a woman's history book and the women who nurtured this evolution. And uh, Ms. Andre Prince took over her family business 42 years ago and was responsible for the growth, not only of her family business, but of this iconic dish. Throughout history of hot chicken, it was like the women in the Prince family and others like Miss Dolly Matthews of Bolton's who were the backbone of these institutions. And to me, it resembles our, the history and the story of our country. Women, specifically black women, who were symbols of strength, simultaneously pushing and carrying us forward. How has diving into this history and writing this book, how has been learning about this, how has that enhanced your worldview? Oh. I love the books. I was like, man, we gotta have this conversation. And I'm like, we should get heavy because this no, is I'm heavy glad we, when you look at it. I'm glad we are. I love, the, but I love that you took it to enhance my worldview. Because that's, that's the part that I'm like, oh, God. Okay. Um, <laughs> Cause I go, I guess for me, I went into it expecting. That's not true. I went into it hoping I could find some of these black women's stories. And I, I actually went into it assuming I couldn't, and that this was going to be a story of absence and of enforced silence. There's a degree of that because of choices we make with archives and, and records, um, choices we make about who gets to talk and who gets remembered. But the fact that I was able to piece together as many brief, brief biographies of these women as I was able to showed me that there is a whole lot more there than I had been taught to expect. And it's, it's a matter of reading past the system and, and what we've created. You know, it's basically a book written entirely out of the telephone directories. That was my, my major resource for the book because you, can you can't follow businesses reliably, black businesses around Nashville very reliably, but you can follow people around Nashville using, using the directories. And so learning how to, to find that, and God bless the folks over at TSLA, Tennessee State Library and Archives, I went in there I think 12 different times and just started pulling in city directories. Most of you are old enough to remember them. They are massive, <laughs> right? And I would pile 40 years worth of Nashville city directories on a table at a time and start sifting through them and trying to figure out who was living where and what was around them and what did it look like. and. What all could I discover and where are the community relationships and how are people meeting each other and who might be going to this business? And I would think I had found it all. And I'd say, thank you so much. I'm sorry you have to reshelve this. And I'd walk out the door. And I'd be back 10 days later. And I, I just know they said, oh, no, she's, she's here again. <laughs> you know, it's. And, and as you unearth these, these stories and these histories, what do we need to do as a city and a society to better recognize and honor the essential accomplishments of women that make us who we are right now? Well, the first thing is, when you choose where to eat hot chicken, choose a business run by a black woman. There are a number of them at this point. Go to Prince's. Go to Bolton's, go to Helen's. We can run the list. There are so many places you can go. So be choosing where you spend your money very carefully. Whenever possible, avoid, you know, this is so basic, avoid the chains. Invest where you want to see the city grow. But also be looking for these places of silence and ask questions whenever you find them. You're not gonna, you might not be able to fully penetrate past that, but you can introduce a little bit more 
into the story of, of who we are and how we got here. And doing that will eventually begin to build out a fuller narrative of the past. And the reason the past matters is because it is how we figure out who we want to be in the future. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when we met, first thing we said was, who are you? Where do you come from? What, how did you, you know? Yeah. It's very determinative. Talking about the future, past and future, an equitable future for Nashville. You touch on this theme of resilience in the book. How many people and their families had to overcome and how they had to become creative to maintain their businesses and in order to thrive. I think I know the answer, but do you see the same need for resiliency in present day Nashville? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, I think it's tragic that it is now somewhere between 70 and almost 100 years past whenever the first barbecue chicken shack was opened. And the same resiliency is necessary. I was, I was speaking with a black female business owner recently, and they're trying to build a new, a new business. They want to expand. Finding a business loan finding the connections necessary and the references necessary. And, uh, and frankly, I'm not a highly connected Nashvilleian, but these are things I could find. My network would just provide that. I would, I would talk to a friend or I would talk to a priest or, you know, like I know the people who I could go to to say, can you help me with this? And, and that's, that is privilege the definition of it. You know, resilience, it's an interesting word. I mean, we, we use it right now as this badge of honor, but I think if given the choice, people would rather live in a society, in a world where resilience is not necessary. Yeah, that's, it's not fun. It's like, you know, you can live your life as you wish, unimpeded. And so while it's important to recognize like people overcoming hardships, how can we recognize tales of triumph and simultaneously eliminate obstacles to individual and, I think, for Nashville, and total communal growth? I feel like a broken. I'm a historian. First of all, I'll talk about the past. Um, but no, I, I think it's important to acknowledge the systems we have created and how we have built them. It's, it's important to acknowledge that the things we say make us more fair, things like the credit system and credit reporting and asking for references, um, things like asking about past criminal history after someone has already served their time and gotten is trying to piece their life back together. Someone who has been caught up in the prison industrial complex, who has been from childhood tracked in that direction, needs the ability to rent an apartment, to get a good job, to get a loan for school, to move on. And until we begin to go through and intentionally dismantle all of these things. We are going to continue to build a city that serves certain people and purposefully displaces others. So tell me, as you were researching and developing and recognizing where the wealth gaps really grew as uh, these development plans and stages of development, which, what do you think was the most consequential stage of development that Nashville has gone through to really establish that solid wealth gap? Reconstruction. Mm. Immediately after the end of the Civil War, we had an opportunity as a nation for a second American revolution to write a new path for ourselves. And instead of doing that, 
we chose to find ways to recreate what had been. We found new ways to institute enslavement. We found new ways to institute wealth gaps. We found new ways to convince poor white people that they shouldn't demand more, that race mattered. We, we found so many new ways to make sure we did not become a place of opportunity for everyone. And I, I think Reconstruction is the biggest miss in American history. Talk to us about the Highway Act of 1956 and those uh, public yet secret hearings that you referred to earlier. Yeah. Did you know I-40 didn't have to go through Jefferson Street? There were other options. Um, there's all sorts of mythology around the interstates that it was part of national security and secretly built, or it was secretly planned so we could get nuclear warheads out of arsenals. And I mean, most of that's fun mythology. Um, we were becoming a nation of cars. We were making a choice to get rid of trains and other forms of transportation. We all like to have a car, go where we want to go. We don't have to share space with other people. It works for Americans. And so interstates were necessary for that to really function. But towns had a chance to decide where they would put their interstates. Nashville got more than we should have, probably because we had very powerful senators, probably also because we have a very centralized location where you can get to most of the East Coast in less than eight hours. So it makes us a little disproportionately important when it comes to transportation. Um, but our, our planners and our developers decided where they wanted interstates to go. For the most part, they put them through poor neighborhoods. For the most part, they put them through black neighborhoods. I really see it as an extension of what was originally called slum clearance and then urban renewal, and today we call gentrification and Nashville next. But it, it's all part of the same idea that in the way to fix a neighborhood is to destroy it and tear it down and move the people on. And, and so it was done that way. They, they held what was a supposedly a public meeting. It was the only opportunity for the community to comment on what was happening. And nobody knew it occurred until it was time for the boulders to move in. It's too late. It kind of reminds me of that scene from uh, A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where they're like, planet Earth is going to be destroyed. We had something posted. You all didn't see it. It's a little bit too late. Yeah. I mean, how many of you read the back pages of the Tennessean? I don't. Me either. So let's talk about the chicken. Prince's Hot Chicken Shack um, and barbecue. The shack itself was a unique experience because it was gaining in popularity. It was open late on weekends, right? 4 a.m.? 4 a.m. And as it grew, obviously, as you said, 70 years plus, and the African-American community was very, found it very popular. But you know, country musicians and people started to catch wind of it, too. But it was a time of very intense segregation here in town. What did they do? Talk to the audience about what they did to kind of fix this uh, seating problem they have, if you will. Oh, it was so brilliant. They built a little room out back and told all the white people to go there. So it was an inversion of what was happening in white restaurants around Nashville, where either black people couldn't eat or they had to walk through the kitchen and sit in some sort of ancillary space. And yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a restaurant in a black neighborhood for black community members run by a black family. They made sure they were not the ones displaced from the very amazing, amazing hand-carved 
benches that they had. What's the symbolism of that to you? It's turning the power structure on its head. It's, there's this amazing Soviet era theoretician whose name I have of course now blanked on because you're all here. <laughs> and um, he did a lot of work with the idea of carnival and, and, and the fool in a court and all of those sorts of things. But it's a way of speaking truth to power without actually, I mean, for the, in this era that we're discussing, for a black man like Thornton Prince III to have actually said what he pro had to have thought about segregation would have put his life in danger. This is social commentary that would not get him killed. That's amazing to find. And it had to, it had to feel so good. It had to feel so good. Um, so yeah, playing by the power's rules in a way that, at least in this little corner of the world, gave him control and gave his community dignity. That's incredible. All right, the inventor. I want to talk yes. about the inventor. You know, throughout the book, you speculate as who was the possible inventor of hot chicken. <laughs> you know, I think it's a list of maybe six or seven names. So many women. It was this interesting, like, mystery. Like, who's we going to find out? Who is this person? You talk about what potentially was going through her mind. Um, and you, you read a passage from. What were your thoughts during this period of speculation as you've been researching and discovering these women and you know the legendary story you know what were your thoughts going through your head as you were trying to figure out what was going through her mind actually in that moment mm. well first of all i don't think it was my two favorite favorite ladies i want it to be either gertrude his first wife or caroline who comes much later in the story and i Given the timing, I doubt it was either of them, but ooh, both of them deserve to have a little, a little revenge. <laughs> Most of the women deserved more than a little revenge, but those two really spoke to me. Um, but it was just recovering what life looked like if you were a poor black woman in the 1920s or the 1930s or the 1940s in Nashville. Um, how very little choice people really had. I, I grew up in a world where people said, what do you want to be? And I really could assume I could do anything. I mean, I'm from, I grew up in Las Casas, Tennessee, so maybe there were a couple of limitations on that idea. But did I want to go to space camp and become an astronaut? My parents would have figured that out. Did I want to become a writer? My parents are supportive of that. I, I played the violin. Like, I, I had so many directions my life could take. And to realize both historically and also today how many people really don't have many many choices in their future, where the future is really set. And you, they can challenge it, but the question, who do you want to be? A doctor, a lawyer, an undertaker, all of those are out of the question. And, and that was really sobering for me. You know, you touch on the relationships Thornton Prince had, and you know, relationships we experience in life, love, affection, betrayal, separation are just a few of the items that come from our, let's call them amorous adventures. <laughs> Passion is really one that stands out to me. I mean, this fire of emotion that became imbued to the literal flesh of the chicken and it changed the course of Nashville's history. 
and you, 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 you talk about Miss Andre's prints and what, what she's done and the continuing of this family legacy. Talk to me about the importance of the passion that women like Andre Prince really had that made us where we are today. I think for many of these women, the passion they had is what, what became their perseverance or their resiliency. And that's a, on the one hand, that is a strength. They survive, they keep working, they keep their businesses alive. On the other hand, oh my goodness, what could they have done? What, I mean, like, the women who have been running the hot chicken shack all of these years, if they had real access to money and power, what could they have done with this business, with this idea? What would the hot chicken festival look like today? Um, how much sooner would somebody like me have known about hot chicken? All of, you know, it's, I, passion kept them going and kept all of this alive. Um, but it was, it, it's another place where there was a lot of limitation. That passion's a hard thing to maintain. Oh yes, it it's exhausting. Going. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting to me because we find, I think in our society, we, we find ourselves you know, becoming passionate about things. A lot of times people are inspired if I've been done wrong. Well, I'm gonna show you, that's a way to get out. Um, it's got acrimony and animosity behind us to get up us off, out of our seats to take action. You know, you, what happens? You break up with someone, you get the haircut, you go to the gym. Uh, a lot of people take that action, but that will only last you but so far. We have to find other things to sustain us and to fuel that fire. I think you're underestimating the power of a good breakup haircut, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> it can work. But you know, after about six, seven months, you got to pick something up and do it again. How can we refuel this passion? How did these ladies refuel that passion and turn it into something that became, you know, ever, ever nurturing and, soup and, and fertile? Maybe that's where passion becomes love. And, and maybe that's the difference between the two. I mean, sometimes you do things just because you have to, right? Um, because you own a business, because you have put a ring on your finger, because whatever it is, sometimes there is duty involved and it doesn't always feel great. Um, and I, I hope that for these ladies, Sometimes when they were doing that, they found a new aspect of it. But I think we're seeing that a lot in our society right now. There's so much that I'm sure many of us in this room right now would like to march about. So much that probably many of us have marched about in the past several years or decades, however long you've been doing the good work. Um, last couple weeks past couple weeks, Lord. Um, yes, so much to march about. <laughs> One of the lessons from the civil rights movement or from the ladies who are doing, who are keeping hot chicken alive and keeping these businesses alive is that it's never about the same day action or the same month action. That affects very little real change. It feels good. It releases a little bit of this pent-up emotion. You will probably see me with a poster board very soon, but that can be ignored by the people in power. And it's showing up the day after that and the day after that and finding how you change your corner of the world, how you challenge power in whatever way is available to you. That's hopefully a little bit of what some of my work is doing. I mean, that's, that's how I show up day after day. And I think that for these women who are opening these businesses, for them, being a business person 
was an act of resistance. In Nashville of that era or Nashville of today, that is challenging power. And that's a form of love, I think. A couple more questions. Sure. Like, this is a human story about humans all day long. And today our relationships are loving and tumultuous. We have the internet as a great place to either seek advice or air out our grievances. Um, is there something we can learn from the past? This resilience, this passion, this strength, this foresight, this sacrifice that these women endured and took on that will help us learn how to relate to one another better as humans? Yes. Number one, if it's worth it, keep doing it. You might not see the change. It might, it's not going to change in the next month, year. Some of the things that have happened recently, it's not going to change in the next decade. Don't give up. Keep working toward it. It feels hard. Find other people you can talk about that with. Um, for those of us in this audience who have power behind us or who have access to power, be willing to sacrifice that. Um, one, of, one of the great gifts for me of this book was a character named Gerald Gimray who was Nashville's first real planner. He ran what happened in the city in terms of planning for until the 1970s. Um, and he's a very educated white guy who means so well. And he does so much damage. Partly because he is trying to make other people in power happy. He's trying to implement what mayors want and developers want and governors want. Partly because he thinks he knows what's best. He's the person with the degree, and oh, don't we like to have a degree? I like to have a degree. I got lots of them. It's not an accident, right? Um, <laughs> so, but he doesn't actually sit down with the communities that he is affecting and say, what do you need? What do you want? What would benefit you? How can I help? He never does that. So to be willing to shut up and get out of the way, to use your, your access and your power to give someone else the opportunity to determine their own future, that's, inc that's an incredibly important step that more of us need to be taking. Um, you think we're getting close to that in our society right now? <laughs> no, I wish. I think that for some people, perhaps, in a limited way, there are some social media outlets that momentarily give them more voice and more, more amplification. Um, I think we grossly overestimate how much can be accomplished through social media, however. Whether you are tweeting your 240 characters or putting together a viral TikTok, I'm not sure actual change is being affected. Um, no, I think that's, it's still a real, a real problem who gets to speak and who does not. So we need to get together over a couple plates of hot chicken, or, or like, the, like you write in the book, the meat and threes, yes. and uh, have some food, break bread, and really start to be in community. Yep, and some of us, frankly, should just shut up. Final question for you. I know you like your hot chicken mild. Yes. How much would it take, how much would it cost to get you to try hot? You don't have anything behind you, do you? No. Okay. No, That's no. Good. <laughs> oh, my. Um, Think of lipstick Rachel. Of lipstick Rachel? She said try hot chicken. <laughs> would she, though? <laughs> Lipstick Rachel tends to shy away from all the spicy food when it shows up at the restaurant. Um, rice is good for me, but um, oh, yeah, I could be bought. <laughs> 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 
let's say it could be, oh, you know what, I think it would be a writing contract. If anybody has access to an editor at one of the big glossies, have I got a story for you. <laughs> okay. If you can get me an actual, an actual attention from a good editor, I'll try hot chicken. Okay, the hot, hot chicken. <laughs> Hot, hot chicken. One bite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Appreciated the questions. Questions. Now time for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, raise your hand. I'll come to you with a mic. We want to get you on the microphone uh, because we're recording today's session. So. You've talked a lot about the Prince family and their legacy to this city. Um, I moved here in 1970, and Prince's Hot Chicken was one of the first places I heard people talk about. Um, and I, like you, don't like hot chicken, so I haven't eaten it a lot, but I respect that history. How much is the family involved in benefiting from the ridiculous surge of hot chicken? Um, or has, has it been usurped by other people with more money, more power, more everything? Um, especially, who the hell is Hattie, Hattie Bees, and where did she come from? Oh, um, one of the great joys of the book was I think I met, mentioned Hattie Bees twice. Yeah, I think so. And it was not an accident. I was like, I. It's a, it's fine. Like earn your money, whatever, but I am not going to contribute to this. Um, they, I mean, Princess is finally on Broadway as of about a year ago. They are upstairs in a food court and there is another hot chicken shack on the corner of the street. And I think that that is really a perfect summary for how the popularity of hot chicken has or has not benefited the Prince family. Um, they are still making chicken. They are still getting interview requests. They are still who you go to, and they should be, when you want to know what is happening and, and what hot chicken is. Um, but they are kind of, yeah, that's when they are they are used, um, and often it is that they are used. Uh, so I, I think it's an ongoing problem. I think, I suspect, this is me sup making some suppositions here, I suspect that they face exactly the same challenges every other black business in Nashville faces when it comes to access to business loans and to Metro City Council and to getting put into future development plans and being made a central part of the city. And that should not be. Hi, the, the full story seems hard to find because the Ryman Auditorium and Hattie B's and Tootsie's and uh, I think it was Lulu's all figures into the Ryman history but then there's the Princess and the Boltons, and now there's the new African American music museum, music museum downtown, and I can see people going there and then walking down to Hattie B's. <laughs> How much tourism is too much, I guess? Tourism is too much when it is being done to the detriment of the people who live in a community instead of to their benefit. And I think that's a very important conversation for Nashville to have. Um, I would suggest that in many neighborhoods right now, tourism is to the detriment of the community. But I think that's the sort of conversation each neighbor should, neighborhood should have that neighbors should have with each other. I think neighbors should have the ability to decide whether they want Airbnbs, how many they want, what those restrictions look like. I don't know that that should be a city-wide ordinance. Um, I think neighborhoods should have the ability to decide 
what businesses go in on their street corners and, and what that looks like. Um, and that has to happen before we move the original neighborhood out. In many cases, we're too late for that. But yeah, no, there is there is so much tourism in Nashville. At one point, I think we had the idea we could trap them all on Broadway. Mm. And well, that's not worked. Well, if you see what goes on on Broadway, they're going to escape. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I run away. <laughs> they're, they're juiced up, if you will. You know, it's something that we talk about a lot on, on, on This Is Nashville. And, you know, I, I've been here less than a year in September. It'll be a year being here in Nashville. And something that I've seen is Nashville is known as Music City. You know Nashville for Music City. You know Nashville for Hot Chicken. Once you come here, you, certain people will know Nashville for its role in the Civil Rights Movement. But... Um, I was out here for maybe five months, and a young man I know, known him since he was 12, he's now 23, I'm coming out to make music. I said, great, you're moving, you're leaving Albuquerque, which is a beautiful place if you've ever been, go out there and relax, but you really, it's hard to kind of expand and to spread your wings, particularly as a young musician. So this is the perfect place for him to come, and I asked him, where are you gonna live? How much money do you got? because it's expensive. I lived in Los Angeles for 12, 13 years. And people ask me, what is Nashville like? What does it remind you of? And I said, it reminds me of LA with the housing crisis. So how are the people who make up Nashville in being Music City, these young, talented artists and musicians from all over and all sorts of genres, how are they supposed to live here now? Because tourism and development has helped this skyrocketing of housing costs. Um, again, I'm not here to tell Nashville what to do. I'm, I'm still a newbie. Um, although, events like this, I'm feeling more and more a part of the community, which I'm really grateful for. But what's, has tourism, it's, it's helped Nashville, but now it, it's too much of a good thing can hurt a little bit. So Nashville needs to really reconsider what it's going to do, or it's gonna be a much different town than what even I recognize being here for less than a year. Got time for a couple more questions. I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate you threading the social justice and justice reform, kind of banking on what you just said about tourism and because that's a big part of, of Nashville as well and what women bear on their shoulders and threading that through the history, the book as a history. Um, because Nashville, you know, is starting to have a real problem with the tourism and the crime and those background checks and people becoming a community and really caring about justice reform and, and um, speaking to that. But thank you for doing that because that is a big part of, of Nashville. And I, I have sent your book to the prisons and they love it and they're <laughs> going to send you back a review whenever they can get it together. I would love that review. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, please. <laughs> okay, we have one time for one more question. Last call. Thank you. Um, mine isn't really a question as much as a statement about the history of Nashville and the current, most current history, like the last 10 years, really needs to be told. Because just in the short time I've been living here, which is a year and a half, I'm from New Jersey, um, it's not tourism that's the problem. It's the people who are moving here and staying. And as all these new townhouses and office buildings are being built, pe new people don't realize the people who lived here are being dispossessed. They can't afford to live here anymore. And so anyone who moves here, unless you're uber rich, you can't even live within the city. And I'm sure that affects the minorities more than anyone else. So the history does need to be told to the new people who are clueless. They come here, they see all these beautiful townhouses and don't realize there were real people living there in small little houses before those were built. I, uh, I agree. I would also say I, it's, it's really 
fun and easy. As somebody who's from here, to blame the people who are coming in. And I mean, I'm, I love to talk about the people from California. <laughs> I can go off. Um, but the people in power in this city right now, the ones who are deciding what development happens, the ones who are deciding our zoning laws and all the rest of those rulings, they're not new. They're not new. And so it is not only about newcomers, it is also about those of us who've been here for generations deciding we're gonna choose community over easy money. And it's hard to do that. That runs contrary to much of what we are taught within our, within our society. And, and so to start challenging that, to start saying there is a price that I'm not willing to pay, and it's right here. This is not worth it to me. You're not paying, it's sort of like, how much would, I, would you have to pay me to eat hot chicken, right? Like, there are prices that are not worth it. Um, always good to see a, new, a fellow New Jerseyan, uh, Trenton born. Um, Something that I was looking into when I first got here, as everyone was saying, so many people have moved here over the years. I said, okay, well, let's see. A question, I had the same thing, like how invested are the people new to Nashville? How invested are they in Nashville? Because that was the question people were asking, old Nashville versus new Nashville, and something that we were exploring. So we kind of took a look at the voting numbers, and for the past 10 years, in metro elections, with all these people moving here, the voting numbers haven't gone up. So my question is, is everyone moving to Nashville, are people moving to Tennessee because of no state taxes, um, the pandemic has afforded people the opportunity to move here and to buy a house, a sight unseen for cash offers. Are they here for what Nashville is or the, just the opportunity that Nashville brings? I think that's a question everybody has to answer for themselves. But can they be inspired to be invested in Nashville? I think so. I really do think so. It's just about explaining to them not only why, but getting them to care. And again, it comes back to community. It comes back to being, being one with each other. I think that's why I kind of end every show. You know, this is Nashville, Kalile Kelowna. We'll see you tomorrow or on Monday and be good to each other because we have to. If we look at the state of the entire world outside of Nashville, the entire world, it's time for us to be good to each other. One more question. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask, I, I thank you so much for the book and um, it's so in, you know wonderful to see African-American history here in Nashville being lifted up and given the visibility visibility that um, you've granted in this book. Um, I, in, in terms of historic preservation of, of structures in, in historic black Nashville, you've talked about the interstates and, and how it divided Jefferson Street. Can you tell us, you talked about the um, original chicken shack on, on Charlotte um, that was torn, it was replaced by a crystal. In your research, did you Fine. Did you come across why it was torn down? Because so much of, of that area, you know, was historic black, uh, an historic black downtown business district, the Cedar Street district. And it's interesting that it was torn down. I just wondered if what you found as to why it was torn down. Yeah, it was part of, as downtown was being we'll put it in quotes, renovated. And, and as they were purposefully moving people out of downtown, um, Charlotte Avenue was designated as one of the major arteries. They renamed it from Cedar Street to Charlotte. They made it one of the major arteries into the capital. Um, and in that process, widened the road. And it was another, it was another urban renewal campaign. And it was another attempt to move people out of Nashville. And Bill Purcell says that was 
purposeful. That was a plan. They did not want people living downtown at one point in Nashville history. And so the, the Charlotte Avenue development was all part of that same initiative to be getting people out of the downtown district and making it more a business where previously there had been what we would call mixed use development um, to make it strictly business versus strictly residential. And of course now we're attempting to move the other direction. Um, and it was also a very blatant attempt to be moving some black businesses further out of the city. Also with what had happened on Jefferson Street, many of the people who would historically have gone to Prince's had been moved. So a lot of their customer base was already gone. And that's where I'm not exactly sure whether Maud, the woman who was running Prince's at that time, whether she chose to move the business or whether it was she was forced to. I suspect it's some combination of all of that. Um, but yeah, Charlotte is, is another urban renewal story. And an ongoing one if you drive down it right now. Uh, 70s. Yeah, Maud moves the business out to Clarksville Highway on, oh, like 73, 74, somewhere in there. Rachel, Khalil, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you for this. Folks, uh, that concludes our program today. Uh, we do have a few copies of Hot Hot Chicken left in the museum store. I say a few and I mean it. So if you don't have your copy yet, go uh, pick it up. And Rachel will be signing copies out in our grand hall where we had our pastries earlier. Uh, so go check it out and get the book and come back and visit with Rachel for a few minutes. So thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day at the State Museum.